Hello, I am Martha, a member of the Spark of Humanity Network. We are here today to talk about hope and how the concept that there's a spark of humanity in each one of us can bring us to a place of a hope that is engaged and vibrant. It isn't the sitting in the bleachers, crossing our fingers, twiddling our thumbs, wishful thinking sort of hope. It's the sort of engaged, gritty, down on the playing field sort of hope. And with me today are Axie Noise, also a member of the Spark of Humanity That's Network. Right. I'm a member of the Spark of Humanity Network. And Amy Lindemann, also a member of the network. There is a podcast that is available on the Spark of Humanity website, www.sparkofhumanity.net, that is an earlier conversation between Axie and me about this issue. So you may want to listen to that. And it may also be available on the Orca Media website. So Amy has agreed to come today and ask, having listened to the podcast, has agreed to come today and ask Axie and me some questions that sort of clarify the issue of how the dynamic, how understanding and claiming our spark of humanity can get us to a place where we feel hope for the world as it currently is. And we're filming this in the 23rd of October in 2020. So that gives you some context. Amy. Mm. All right. So these questions come as a combination of a number of different people that viewed the first podcast. So start from the top. So during these unknowing times with COVID and the election, guided meditation is a way to develop and increase the spark glow, as you have said. Are there other ways that people can develop mindfulness of spark or increase their spark other than guided meditation? Maybe there are other self practices that you do. Thanks for asking. Did you get that question, yes. Axie? Okay, yeah. good, <laughs> good. Um, do you want to respond to that first or do you want me to go first? You go. Well, yeah, I, I just think it's in, uh, in using um, the techniques that we practice inside of the meditation. We actually uh, practice envisioning ourselves meeting and others, first of all, where it's a, that those conversations have been on the phone. So we only hear each other's voices. And we picture our sparks, our individual sparks, and then we picture the sparks of those on the phone. And then we picture the sparks of people in the future who might be listening. And, and each time we picture them, we picture our own individual spark of humanity meeting the other sparks. So how to do it is to, when you're actually meeting people or on the phone with people or in any kind of interaction, it's not necessarily I would, for myself personally, it's not just people, although that's really where our problems are today. But, you know, with birds, uh, stones, uh, important, you know, uh, objects that come into our life on a daily basis to, to practice acknowledging the life within that object or being. And it's like a rainbow. I have a pot of gold, you have a pot of gold. I have a pot of gold, you have a pot of gold. So anyway, that's, and it's very simple. Not a, doesn't take a lot of time, but over time, I think it has an effect, and I'm just praying it has a big effect. We're, it's, it's not something we can actually see, you know, uh, prove that this is working. You know, it, it's, that's hard to do. But it may, what, what I do know is it helps me. I think it helps, has helped Martha. It strengthens something. And um, so that's. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Axie. <laughs> it's the, the, I personally don't envision my spark. Um, the, the guided meditations are links. Access to them is on the Spark of Humanity website. And that's a guided meditation that has up to now been led by me, helping people connect with their spark and connecting through their spark to other people's sparks. And that's the, the basic way that's out there. But when I first began to do this work, 
which was 40 years ago or so, um, it was a matter of connecting between my spark and the spark of someone I was having a hard time with or someone I was scared of or someone who I might have a hard time with. And just, just but from my spark, connecting with their spark, hopefully before I'm in their physical presence, because I get rattled in the physical presence. But if I have a moment or a day or a week of preparation, and I'm going into a challenging situation, mm -hmm. I can connect with my spark through my spark to connect with and affirm these other people's sparks. And that acts to strengthen my spark, although that wasn't the point. That's only become evident in the past three or four years. But it acts to strengthen my spark, and hopefully their strengthened spark acts to erode their defenses and release their distortions and clarify their bafflement, as it says elsewhere in our the videos that we've given and on the website. And a little book that we And use. there's a little booklet mm -hmm. that we didn't bring with us today. So there you have it. But that's the, the guided meditations are a recent acquisition and recent growth of this. Development, yeah. Development, yeah. development mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. came from the roots groups we had in 2017, which is what brought Axie into the work, I think. And that's the most that's what's obvious out there. But the personal work to get, it's, use, it's useful in any situation of conflict or potential conflict or anxiety or fear or any of those things. Because when I, through my spark, connect with the spark of humanity and someone that I'm scared of or you know don't like what they're doing, or wish they'd just go away. And I know I'm old enough to know they're not going to just go away. And the only, the constructive, not the only maybe, but the, what I've learned as the most constructive way of engaging is my spark to their spark. And understanding that it seems that when their spark is strengthened by my affirming it, um, that, that their defenses are slightly eroded, and their distortions are maybe a little released once the d defenses are eroded. And then their bafflement may be clarified. They may have more of an understanding of what got them scared. So that makes them less scary if they understand why they're scared. Yeah. All right, good. Um, how has the spark knowledge changed your life personally? How has the spark knowledge changed your life personally? For me, it, um, well, it's given me uh, a base to go to um, in relationship with other people. Um, and it's, it's not something, actually, to be honest, it's not something I am necessarily conscious of in the moment in a conversation. Um, but I've noticed that the quality of, of communication is uh, different. Before, we, before the conversation even starts, and this is not with some ideologue or some archetypical being, that, like political TV person or something like that. This is with people that I speak to. Um, uh, not that I don't apply the spark work to people like that, but more uh, in my own locale and in my zip code. Um, it changes the nature, uh, my base. It, I found that it changes the nature. And I'd have to say that there is a trust now, a trust, a kind of um, a, a faith a something that has strengthened uh, just the base I, that I'm the, the gravity, the space that I inhabit when I am in contact with others. I, I try to come from it's a different place I'm coming from. Um, so it, yes, I think it has profoundly changed my life 
And it's very, uh, it's not in ways that I can necessarily articulate. I probably should have, you know, I haven't done my homework. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I'm not telling you the truth right in this moment. It, it's not something that I can, I'm not sure I'll ever be able to articulate how it's changed. But the, the it's inside work that you do with others. You practice this work with others, and it's inside work. So we each have our own, in the guided meditation, even though it's guided, we have our own internal work that evolves out of that guidance. And, uh, and, and so we're all kind of moving in, in the same direction, but each with our own uh, connection to the world. And, I, you know, I, I'm not sure how it changed, although I think it strengthened the faith and trust that I have in people. It's lessened any kind of fear, which is a good thing. Anyway, that's all I have. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, how has the spark work or concept changed my life? Yes. yes. Well, I, um, most obviously during this time of pandemic and the the incredible um, horrors that I am aware of in the world around me, um, it's given me a sense of purpose. It's given me a, a sense of trajectory. It's also sort of an, an instrument of my formation as a human being because I believe in this work and I know that my uh, well-being, my wholeness, are contingent upon my being faithful to this work and true to this work. So there's a, so it's keeping me. It helps me stay on the path. Anyway, it's because it's been 40 years, and I would have grown and changed a lot in 40 years anyway, let's hope. Um, well, it has, speaking of hope, it's given, it's given me hope because through the spark work, I found early on it was just about changing you, you know, and you're, you know <laughs> strengthening your sparks. <laughs> You know, I'm fine, thank you very much anyway. Um, but doing this work, and it was through Axie that I became aware that, that oh, they're my own defenses and my own distortions that are getting in the way of my doing the work. So I become aware that, because the basic unit is I cannot claim my spark in, alone. In order to claim my spark, the action of claiming my spark, which is the foundation of the work, requires that I connect with and affirm the spark in someone else. So that's what, how I connect my spark, how I claim it is in connection with someone else. So when I do that and I am connecting my spark with their spark, my spark becomes strengthened. And as my spark becomes strengthened, like I want their defenses to erode, I want their distortions to be released, I want their bafflement to be clarified. <laughs> I might be willing to have my bafflement clarified if I'm willing to admit that I have any bafflement, of course, which is always an issue. But I become willing to have my defenses eroded through the work because I believe in the value. And I become willing to have my distortions released. I can't put words on my distortions except maybe as they're in the process of being released. But I know that I have them, I have to admit, I do. And to allow them to be released, and that allows the process, we talk about in the network that we're all creatures of a, an ever-evolving multi-dimensional dance. And we're not gonna get into the dance too much, I think, but the fact is it's in motion, and it's a multi-dimensional thing. And the dance knows where it wants us. We have each have our optimal place within the dance. And I don't know what that is with my head, but my spark knows where it belongs. 
And the dance draws my spark into my right place in the dance, my right size, my right relationship within the dance. And it's at that, <clears throat> it's at that place, as I get closer and closer to my right place in the dance, which is, of course, ever evolving and multidimensional. So I can't say, I've got it today. That's great. I'm set. Um, because it's ever evolving. I need to stay alive to the dance through keeping my spark as undefended and undistorted as possible. And so that gets me to the relationship in the dance where I find hope because I'm in touch with something. I'm in touch with the living tissue of the dance. And I really get it viscerally that this I'm a member, a creature of a dance that's infinitely large and it's in charge and it knows where it's going and I don't. And my only joy and comfort are in cooperating with the dance and being a part of it and enjoying it. Thank you, Amy. So going off of that with the dance, what do you feel happens to our spark when we pass on this when we plane die, of living? Mean, yeah. When I've, Ax, do you have any sense about that? Um, I, I, I don't think anything happens to the spark. Um, I think the spark stays a spark. Um, um, and maybe it joins other sparks who have been transformed in that, you know, it, basically when we die, the, the body stops functioning, but the spark is, is uh, not just the body, it's always something beyond that. So I would say, you know, the body, look, to answer the question that you just asked before about how did it affect our lives, basically you're asking us the whole point of the work is transformation. That's the whole deal. So you're asking two people who, who have been caterpillars and might, at this stage, we might be in cocoons now. I'm not quite sure where we are in our transformation stage. But you're asking us to describe something that is ongoing or, or asking a butterfly, you know, that's just hanging from the milkweed, you know, with wings that it doesn't quite know what the heck is going on, you know, uh, what's going on? And, and it's very hard to describe trans uh, human transformation. And, that, and I think as profound as that is, and in as in, inarticulate as I'm being right now, uh, that, that's the same thing that's ongoing in death. That's what I would say. Um, the, the spark is it's another transformation. Radical, radical. But I don't think this a spark will prop my spark isn't going to blink too hard. My spark is much more in uh, an, uh, it's not an intellectual exercise, but my spark knows what to do, mm -hmm. knows the work. I'm the problem with my spark. I'm like a sea anchor. My spark is like, you know, a, a, a hunting dog. It knows what, it's on the scent. And I think that's, you know, as, as, as willing as I'm being to release these delusions and distortions and, you know, the ways that I might fool myself, my spark is fine. At any rate, that's... <laughs> Thanks, actually. <laughs> I would say more simply that I think my my sense is that my spark just goes back to the fire that it's ah, a spark of. There you go. Just that, you know. All right. <laughs> um, what are the biggest distortions and erosions that you see in yourselves or other people? Distortions and or erosions or erosions. All or the defenses. Defenses. Delusions. Yeah. Delusions. Mm -hmm. What are the biggest ones? You want to bite it that sure. way first? <laughs> um, I, I think the, there is a, uh, a delusion and a um, distortion of, of we, we are actually, we come by it honestly. Our, our school systems don't help in this regard. Our society doesn't help. It, there, we, we are taught to believe that we're separate. And uh, 
you know, that we, uh, that we, to be strong, you must be independent. And it's a weakness to ask for help. Uh, so yeah, I think that those are the, uh, at this time, those are the main problems that we have. That, pa that, that, pa that the exercise of power is all. Um, you know, power over, I mean, not yeah. power itself has, you know, that's the spark, basically. But the, but the power over others, you know, yeah, those are big ones, big ones. What are, okay, let me, I, the way I, I have to think about this as, I have to start with, my understanding of the way this develops is that there's a bafflement. I don't know how to handle something. When you come out of the womb, how do I, how do I cope? What, what do I do? What do I need to do in order to be safe? <clears throat> so that creates the distortions. Uh, maybe if I smile all the time, maybe if um, I mm -hmm. you know, do whatever, we tend to pretzel ourselves in order to feel safe. And then that hurts and we don't want to be aware of it. And so we create the defenses to, to keep people away from our distortions and to keep us from feeling our distortions because they're painful and they come from a bafflement. So the, the primary distortions are, they come from the lack of, of appreciation that there is a spark of humanity in everyone. And that therefore feeling that power over has any meaning is anything other than just silly and or destructive. And the, the, I'm losing it here. Let's see if I can find it again. Um, the distortion of, it's all fear-based. The distortions all come from fear. And so the, I don't tend not to look at problems. I tend to look at solutions. The solution is, to appreciate the spark and the power of the connection of the spark and the sparks in communion and the sparks working together and the power that that happens. It doesn't, looking at the nature of other people's distortions or the nature of defenses, they're there. And if I start talking about the distortions and the defenses that I see out there, the only way for me to see them is through my projecting from my own distortions and my own defenses. Yes. And that, that doesn't solve anything. It may, if I'm awake at the moment, help me become aware of my defenses and my distortions. But they're all basically fear-based. They're all because we, we want to be safe. We need to recognize our inherent safety, that our sparks cannot be extinguished. They cannot be corrupted. They cannot be destroyed. damaged. They cannot be destroyed. They cannot be put out. They are f safe. They're fine. It's all the crap that we that accretes around our spark through our lack of understanding the power of our spark, and that's what causes the problems. And then we project on other people, and we feel separate, and we all this stuff. But we all have this. We all have a spark of humanity. All sparks are made of the same stuff. Sparks have a natural affinity for each other. So when we begin to realize that and practice that and work our way down through, this is what I've found for myself, the, it's a geological process, the layer upon layer upon layer of delusion, of distortion, of defense, of decades in my case of building up beliefs and habits of response that are based on the illusion of separation, the lack of trust and awareness of the infinite, infinite life of the spark. Mm -hmm. And I think, last question maybe for a pause, but is what can alter your spark in ways that can impact your life negatively? You got an answer for that one, Axie? What can alter my spark? In ways that can impact your life negatively. The the lens through which my you know the this, this, this stuff that is me that surrounds my spark the idea of who I am, uh, 
for instance, if I am convinced in a certain situation that I'm a victim and that it's that person out there that has victimized me, and it may be that I'm, I've actually was a victim, but over time I might continue to decide that I'm still a victim because that's the very good defense. I can't, I am protected then. I can't make a mistake if I'm, uh, if I'm a victim. And that's the kind of thing that you begin, or one can begin to become aware of um, doing this work. That you, oh my goodness, I'm choosing to be a victim. So it can be, it's challenging and it's a little scary sometimes because to step out of that, that is a defense, you know. Um, to, to, to take down that wall or to let that wall erode by, but this is the trick. It, I can't really just do it on my own. I need to connect with another person in order to, to, to bring down that wall. And, and it may be just to, to talk about the, the trap of victimhood, but uh, I, can, I can let it melt away by talking with another person another and recognizing their spark letting them see my spark, my weakness my whatever things kind of melt it's it, it's wonderful <laughs> so okay so nothing can impact my spark negatively however doing this work if i'm doing it deeply when i'm when I'm doing it deeply enough, things can start changing in my life. I can find myself responding differently, and that can be scary, and that can feel very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So it can feel negative, but there's nothing, nothing negative comes from this process. It may, it may bring into, it may wake up some illusions, some delusions from the past, but it's all safe. The process cannot go wrong as long as I'm in touch with my spark and paying attention to that, acknowledging the defenses, the distortions, and the bafflements that pack around it, but knowing that they are not real and that they are being eroded and released and clarified through this work. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Time for a break. Time for a break. <laughs> Thank you much. We'll be back. Welcome back. Um, so continuing on with the questions, why is now the time for the spark work? Well, that's a good question. Martha, Thank you. could you take off your mask? Oh, I could time? take off my mask. <laughs> just, nice. just for this. For uh, right, yes, <laughs> right. It's such a nice mask, though. Um, <laughs> why is this the time for the spark work? <sighs> Well, um, it seems to be the time for the spark work. I, I, the spark insight, as I said earlier, came 40 years ago, so it's been sort of brooding, festering, composting, uh, stewing, did I say brewing? Brewing and brooding for that period of time. And I personally have been waiting for, I mean, I've been open to waiting for application um, and it first first clear application was during the Standing Rock crisis of summer of 2016 that's what sort of got the spark of humanity network started and that it has continued to grow through the roots groups which of which Axie was an early part and then the, the network and the website and all that has been growing. But the particular use for it at this time is, in the history of humanity, I would say there's never been such an obvious time of crisis. The environmental, if the planet can survive, what we're doing to it, what we've done to it, that, that'll that be grace. I'm not sure, maybe the planet has a, has a spark of some sort that, that I like to connect with to encourage the ecosystem to continue to sustain us. 
and to be resilient and generous as it has been since it was first created. Just that is one reason. And everything else that we all know um, that I don't need to delineate because each one of us holds it differently, but the spark work gives us, gives us a point of engagement that everyone can do. No one is hopeless. No one need be hopeless. No one is helpless. No one needs to feel frustrated about what can I do? Because spark work is something that everybody can do regardless of their mental capacity, their physical capacity, their age, their political party, their gender preferences, their prejudices, where they live in the world, spark work is available to all human beings. And there's never been a time when it's been more needed more broadly throughout the planet. Axie? Why is it? Well, to me, uh, Martha said we started with a root work back in 2016 and, and with, the, uh, with the water protectors and trying to develop a way of supporting them perhaps without, have, without the ability to actually be there. We couldn't have known that we'd be where we are right today. And yet, to me, this work is is it matches up, it parallels. There may have been other times in, in our history where things have been this bad, but there's never been a time when we all knew it. We're all together in this knowledge. And, and uh, to me, there is a, that's why I initially was talking about connecting not only with human beings, but with, with our connection with the earth, with, with wild animals, with uh, stars, with, uh, basically, I think that it helps transform us as a human beings to understand what we are here to do. That a lot of the things when we talk about bafflement and distortions are in our belief systems as to why we are here. They are attached to those. Is it really that we're here to acquire stuff and get rich and stomp on the, you know somebody else's back so that we can think that we're higher in some kind of social pyramidal thing, scheme? I, I don't think so. Um, so uh, to me, the spark work, in, to put it in a nutshell, is, uh, and why now? Because it's so desperately needed that we remember who we are and why we're here and make sacred our relationship with each other and with the, with the earth and the world. This, it, it is the reset, as sanctification, whatever, make sacred again. And to recognize it's not like it's ever not been sacred, it's just that we went wandering off the path. We're way off the path. And this work helps individuals come to a place where we can put ourselves together back on the path help each other and not not have to necessarily you know breathe in each other's faces in the process of doing that work mm. we can do it uh, if you have a phone even if you don't have a phone one of the things that Martha says and I'll, then I'll shut up it, it, during the guided meditation is when when she's making a transition to another part of the meditation she says remembering that we can always return to this work. And that is when we're off the phone and we're not in direct communication with each other, we can still pick up the work and do it. With, you don't even need a phone. But 
you know, it's nice. Uh, it's, isn't it amazing and wonderful that we have all this technology now to help us to do this work and connect when it's so important that we do? Yeah. I, I would also yeah. say, taking on that, that it's, it's, uh, it's affirming the dance. This time it's, it's, it's recognizing our place in the dance and affirming the dance so that the dance can, can go more joyfully and with less uh, collateral damage. Uh, you both have made reference a couple of times to the root work. And I'm just wondering, what's the difference between root work and Sparks work? That's a good question. Let's see if I can think of an answer. The, the roots groups came in early 2017 when the shock of awareness of the depth and of the divisions in the United States became evident to people who had not been aware that, that this country was as deeply and tragically divided as it is. And people were, were reeling as if they were palm trees and a tsunami and an earthquake. And some of us thought, these people don't, if, if you have a sturdy, strong root system, you can go with the breeze and the earthquake and you'll be OK. You won't break. You won't shatter. And that, that brought the idea of having, creating a setting where people could get in touch with their roots, which is their access to the resources they need in order to feel, this is how it's developed, it's in order to feel safe enough to be willing to be transformed by the spark work, because we have to be willing to be transformed in order to be agents of transformation ourselves. And so the roots groups, thanks to the local Kellogg Hubbard Library who sponsored the series that winter, um, were about helping people, encouraging people to connect with their root systems, which have boiled down into stability. We need stability. We need access to wisdom or truth, whichever way you want to say it. And we need a sense of community. And when we have those, we are strong and we are safe. And that's, we know we're, we know we're safe. We recognize our safety. And our spark can do the work it wants of transformation. So that was the roots work. The groups were around that. At that time, there was no thought of doing what we're doing now on the guided meditations that Axie referred to a couple times on the telephone, um, which is just easier than Zoom for some of us. Um, so the, it, but the roots groups started with reading the little spark booklet. And we went to our sparks first, and then the sparks would know what the roots need. The, so the sparks would sort of direct the roots. So it's, the spark work is just the current iteration of the roots groups. Which, But if people wanted to start roots groups in their area, we'd support that and help them do that. But the spark work sort of has folded that in and continues it on. Hmm. The, for me, the root work was, you know, looking back, one can see a little bit, you know, uh, better and, and imagine uh, for me, the root work was almost like a um, uh, being in utero, connected to, it was practicing, in, in that it was nurturing, it was, uh, it was uh, embryonic in the nature of the, of the work that we were doing. It's, it's sort of a beginning phase. And it's also, to me, it was a lot to do with the nurturing of being, of understanding that, um, and again, practicing, this was, we were practicing together, in actually together, not virtually, but in a space together, where we were uh, uh, envisioning our roots going out and touching, and then they, these roots were magical roots because they could go across the country and around the world, I mean, and, um, and, and to be nourished. Also, the uh, idea of a taproot, 
uh, that goes so deep in the earth that it hits an aquifer that is referred to as uh, wisdom, the aquifer of living, living wisdom. Uh, these are concepts that are helpful um, uh, in the work to, to understand, because they're, um, they're real. And, uh, and yet sort of baffle the mind in the process of, of working with them, because you're kind of thinking, gee, I'm making this up. Well, we are. We are making it up, but that does not mean it's not real. Before there was an airplane, somebody sat around and drew pictures of something. This is something we do as human beings. We make this up, and the, in that process, it becomes real. And so, yeah, I felt it. It was, and, and still to this day, it's a wonderful thing to be able to sort of revert back to an interior world where we are fed and we actually breathe through our navels, <laughs> you know, through a whole different system that is beyond our ken as human beings here. But we, we breathe in a different way. We, and, and, and we're fed all through one source uh, and through a mother source. That's where I felt the root system. Uh, that practice was, was helping to birth this whole new, this spark work. And which the roots, is, yeah. you know, which is very active and, and of a different nature in a, in a certain way. But the roots meditations are now part of the spark meditations. Yes, they we always refer it in. to the roots. Mm -hmm. It's not right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I don't breathe through my navel. Axie may breathe through my navel. I don't. I just want to let you know. Okay. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Uh, in a world where we spend so much time on Zoom and uh, telephone calls, um, how have you guys seen COVID affecting the spark or the spark work? Mm -hmm. um, well, pre-COVID, people didn't spend so much time on the video or on telephone calls. So that was, that was good. Uh, didn't, I mean, didn't do Zoom. Um, so the... The COVID, the pandemic has been a great boost to the spark work as far as I'm concerned because it's, it's, it's sort of <laughs> during the, particularly the early points when people were very isolated and locked in, they were looking for anything to do that might be constructive and positive and new and different. And so it's been very helpful and we had a series of meditations of engaging the pandemic um, and and eroding the domination system, which we're not going to go into here. But um, it's it's it hasn't. It's it's been helpful. It's been it's been like a, the pandemic has been like a poultice that is drawing the spark work to to visibility and to make people aware of that there's this op opportunity. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. I, I find myself uh, in greater communication. In other words, because of the absence of, of, of friends and family and humanity that is physically in my life, I am reaching out more. I realize what I'm missing. I, I think, my God, uh, what a gift I had and I didn't even know. Uh, I just thought it was always going to go on that way forever. And to have this, it, this is the gift of the whole thing, is to, that we have the opportunity to know what this is like. And while at the same time having this odd virtual ability, which is to me like face-to-face uh, uh, -face light, so I have to do twice as much of it in order to, for the same effect. So I find myself, yes, I'm using this more than I, than I did because sitting with another human being the way we are today is, is so much, it's like, it's stronger. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's more powerful. It feeds me 
to a greater extent where, it, it, because that's what I'm used to as a human being, now I'm learning how to appreciate uh, us in our little boxes and in Zoom and, and, and on the phone and, and uh, FaceTime and stuff like that. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a learning to, uh, to accept the fact that there actually is a human being on the other side. And I'm not thinking it's a bad thing. I'm actually just totally grateful that we have this. I, I don't even sit around and talk about, oh, I wish it was the old days, because it, 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 that sort of puts down the gifts that we have, these tools that we have that we can use in this time. And we better use them. Thanks, Sexy. <laughs> Um, so we are currently a week and a half away from the election, and what happens when your spark does not agree with other sparks? For example, like in the election, is there a way to change this? How do we get past that? Mike, good question. Good question. Uh, the, um, my spark always agrees with other sparks. My, um, my bafflement may be heightened by other people's distortions and defenses. Because my bafflement is heightened, I, my, and the fear comes up, the distortions, my distortions may become activated and become stronger and fiercer. And therefore, my defenses may get stronger and more hostile. Um, and of course, when I'm doing that, the the spark of the other person that the same thing is happening with them they're they're because in the interaction if we're not in tune with our sparks and i'm coming at them from my defenses and my distortions they're going to be scared they're going to be baffled so their distortions are going to become tighter and more distorted and more twisted and their defenses are going to become more hostile and more egregious um so so the the solution that the spark work offers, and you know, we've had to grind through to come to this point, to get to this understanding that the solution for each for me personally, and everybody else is welcome to take it too, right? Um, is that when I claim my spark and connect it with the spark and the other person. I know that my spark has an affinity with that person's spark. And I know that everything that makes it difficult for me to connect is my stuff. And so it's a matter of the language we use. And is, it's, am I willing to be transformed in order for my spark to connect powerfully with the spark of that other person? Am I willing to become willing to be transformed? Am I willing to become willing to become willing to be transformed? Um, hopefully I am, because that's the only way, that's the way that the spark work gets traction in the world, in the current situation. So it's, you know, it's on me, because my spark and that other spark are just happy to be together. They are just, they know they're the same stuff. They like being, they, that's a joy for the spark. It's all the rest of the garbage. And I only have control over my own garbage. And the way to deal with my garbage and that person's garbage is to strengthen my spark. And I do that through claiming my spark and affirming and connecting with their spark. Mm. I second that. Okay, good. <laughs> totally. Okay, good. We just got a, got a little, yeah. I don't know how many more questions Amy has, so right. we'll see. Not many. No, I second okay. that. I I, um, I think maybe that's all I need to just, yeah. There is no disagreement. Uh, any kind of thought around this. My spark, when, at first I was a little confused because I thought I was directing my spark. And um, in this, you know, let's say we're in a, a phone conversation, and, and, and I'm in a guided meditation, and I was thinking I was directing my spark. But actually, after I learned the process, which is very similar each time, my spark, it was like a, a little puppy dog or a, or a horse or, that knows what to do. I 
any kind of manipulation I was trying to put on my spark was not helpful. My, so I just realized I'm riding my spark. My spark, I need to trust that. And I need to try not to think too much. Because when my spark, let's say my spark confronts an enemy, um, which I perceive in my mind, this is enemy, I have to let go of that and just let my spark do the work. If, if, if I'm thinking enemy, enemy, then all these defenses and all this crap starts building up. So it's a question of trust. And it's not, uh, I'm not saying I can do it easily, but, but that's what it is. It's letting go of these ideas that come along with the work. When you're in the process, and maybe a, the face of someone comes up, and you realize this is a person, and you'll think enemy, and then try to release that like a balloon. That's just a thought. And then let the spark go, and the spark spins around, and they, you know, they do what they do. And then you have some faith that it might take time for the transformation. You know, those things may take time, and it's, that's out of my control. And as th thank God it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, X. Uh, what is it about spark work that allows for hope? I think the the base, the basic tropism, the basic draw of spark work is towards hope, um, hope for a better world. It's it's simple. It's accessible. It's powerful in a very subtle and unquantifiable way. And. What I'm finding is that it draws me into touch with the, with the fabric of the dance. There, there's something, I think of it all as fabric or tissue, a living tissue um, from which all life and creativity emerge. And it, that's a, a tissue from which the dance, which generates the dance, perhaps the dance of which I am a creature. The dance creates me, and I'm a member of the dance. So it's very abstract. But thanks for asking. So I, I, when I get into right, when I get into, when I become right-sized, and in right relationship, with true relationship with all that is, then there's hope. Because all that is, is bigger than me. And when I look around at the history of the formation of this cosmos, this universe, and the development of life, and the beauty, and the power, and the experience that we have here on this blessed planet, that I know that there is something larger and very creative and very good and very uncorruptible, like the spark, and that the closer I am into that, the more I experience life within myself and around myself. And there is that hope of that hope of the engagement that I am where I need to be, where I belong in the dance, and that I'm affirming the dance and wholeheartedly participating in the dance. And that's where hope is, because I trust the dance, because it's so much bigger and better than I am. Hmm. It's the way of putting into action. Uh, it, it, it's the way of participating. When, for me, when I sometimes feel that I, there's nothing that I can do, um, but it's also, uh, it can be challenging in that I, my, this is a, a personal admission, I sometimes find myself doubting that, that it, can this really work? And, and yet, I have evidence um, that it works in my life, therefore, the, the challenge is to just see 
that if it works for me and if it works for you and if it works for you and it's helping what does this add up to it does that what is that and uh, and is that lake of living wisdom that aquifer of living living wisdom uh, can I access that can I be a part of of this in a meaningful way through my through my mind but it's but it's not necessarily by you know being really smart or something like that no no it's from being willing and being open to transformation for the good so that's all so thank you both for um, your thoughtful answers and time. Um, you know, we've over this time have covered death, COVID, the pandemic at large, the election, um, and just wanted to give you guys space if there was any big takeaways you wanted to make sure that people knew or if there was anything that came up for you that you want to cover that we just hadn't had time to cover yet. Thanks, Amy. I would just encourage you to look at the Spark of Humanity website and go to the events page if you're interested or just cruise it, see whether you want to. We're exploring these insights. We're just, it's like, yeah, it's, a, it's an experiment here. And the guided meditations that Axie has been referring to, the schedule is on the website on the events page. So we welcome you to join us anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, thanks, Amy. You, you helped to reveal more. More shall be revealed, and hopefully you'll come back and help us to reveal it. Thank you. And thank you, Orca Media. Oh, thank yes. you.